Hey everybody, Mark Fox here with Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel, Forever Free Ministries. Why are most Christians just guessing about the Antichrist when all along there is overwhelming evidence of who is the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7 and in Revelation 13? In this video, we will give you 10 clues, 10 clear clues that expose the identity of the Antichrist. If you want to know what the mark of the beast is, you must first identify the Antichrist. So just before we dive into this very important message, I want to get this book into your hands. It's called The Mark of the Beast. It identifies the Antichrist beast, the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and much more. All you need to do is click on the link below. You can give a donation at this time if you would like. It's appreciated, but not required. So now let's go to my message on the Antichrist. So is the Antichrist near or here? Let's read Revelation 14. Read this together with me. Are you ready? Here we go. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a what kind of voice? Loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. You don't want the mark of the beast. Now, I know there's so much uh, conjecturing and speculation and guesswork about what is and what is not the mark of the beast. But I'm here to tell you, that you cannot know what is the mark of the beast unless you know who the beast is. You cannot understand. All, you're going to just guess for the rest of your life. If you don't know who the Antichrist is, you're just going to guess about what's the Antichrist mark. Let's get first things first. You must identify the Antichrist beast. Now, Daniel and Revelation go together. So both of these books, these twin books, these inseparable uh, books, like bookends, these two books talk about extensively the Antichrist. In the Old Testament book of Daniel and in the New Testament book of Revelation, both of these books give us information, give us characteristics of the Antichrist. Now, this message tonight, as all of my messages, are not politically correct. We just go right to the Word of God, regardless of how politics sways back and forth and the pendulum goes back and forth. God's Word is unchangeable, unshakable. And in this Word, we ha can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, unequivocally, we can know what is the mark of the beast by first exploring who is the Antichrist. And so that's what we're going to do. And so... Then the Bible describes those who are preaching these messages. You see, we just read, just before this, we were just reading Revelation 14, 9 through 11 about a warning, do not get the mark of the beast. Or you get the wrath of God and seven last plagues. It sounds pretty serious to me. This is no trivial pursuit here tonight. This is very spiritual entree. You know, this is, this is the real thing we need to be feasting on. And verse 12 describes those who are preaching this. Here again, underscoring the importance of obeying Bible prophecy. Here it is. Let's read this together. Here we go. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Or the endurance of the saints. Keep the commandments of God. How many fingers do you have? Ten. How many commandments are there? Ten. Do you think that's a coincidence? No. Whatever your hand does, remember the Ten Commandments. Wherever your feet walk, Ten toes, ten commandments. How many agree we are to walk in obedience? Whatever we do, when we shake hands and say, okay, it's a deal, it's with honesty and integrity. Wherever you go, you go because you're in obedience to God's will. Amen? And so, everyone will soon be tested about the prophetic mark of the beast or the mark of the Antichrist. T three different words are used about the Antichrist. The word Antichrist and the little horn of Daniel and the beast of Revelation uh, chapter 13 and other chapters, Revelation 14. 
Is almost everyone listening to the Antichrist without knowing it? Is that really possible? Oh yeah. The Antichrist will have everyone fooled with the exception, Revelation 12, verse 17. Everyone is going to be fooled and deceived except for a small group on planet Earth. Revelation 14, verse 17. And the dragon, the devil, was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? That's the church. Everybody say church. What's the church made of? People. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. In the King James, I like the King James better. I've got the new King James here. It's the word remnant. Remnant. When you think about remnant, do you think about humongous? Oh. So in, as you look at the totality of population in the billions, the Bible just says a remnant are going to understand these prophecies and obey them. Now, don't get me wrong. There'll be many people that hear it and to a degree understand it, but they don't want to obey it. You must obey Bible prophecy. Remember the other night we focused on how, how Jesus said that Jerusalem would be destroyed. And... Um, and that's exactly what happened. But not one believer perished. Why? Because they obeyed the prophecy. Do you know that not one righteous person is going to receive any of the seven last plagues? It pays to know Bible prophecy. How many would vote saying, Lord, we vote for not getting any of the plagues? All those in favor say aye. Okay. Well, you got to do more than just a little vote here. I'm going to agree. Every day you say, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I want to obey you. And as long as you're walking in, in trust and in love to Jesus Christ, those plagues will not fall on you. But they will fall on the wicked. So how many want to be in that remnant? Amen. So Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. That's the remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How many see the, the, the similarities between Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12 that we just read on the screen? Both keep the commandments of God. Both have Jesus Christ, right? And, um, and so you're de dealing there with the perseverance of the saints, the endurance of the saints, the patience of the saints. And then here you're dealing with those who keep the commandments of God. Once again, same group, same group. So the world will be convinced that God is with the Antichrist so that the Antichrist will look like it's Christian. It'll look good. It'll look appealing so that even the average Christian will believe it unless they're pleading with God for an understanding of his word, just like Daniel did in Daniel chapter nine. So. The Antichrist will appear to have the answers to a world in turmoil. Are we not a world in turmoil like never before? Searching for answers. And isn't it in situations like this where you can end up believing in a false Messiah, believing in the Antichrist? The devil wants to delude us. You cannot know what is the mark of the beast or the mark of the Antichrist unless you first identify the Antichrist because it is the mark of the Antichrist. And Mark, you already said that. Repetition is the key to retention. While many are looking into the future when some dictator will arise and capture the imagination of the masses, meanwhile, everybody say meanwhile. Meanwhile, could it be that meanwhile the Antichrist is underneath everyone's noses but we're not sniffing, we're not smelling, we're not we're not investigating like we should. We're not observing like we should. Could it be that the Antichrist is in clear view of everyone, but we are looking in the wrong direction? The majority are going to be swept away by lies. Mm -hmm. The world will obey the Antichrist marching orders. And some of those marching orders have been going out and going out. Well, some say Roman ne uh, Emperor Nero, he was the Antichrist. Uh, Mussolini, Hitler, all sorts of different opinions about who is the Antichrist. Ronald, six letters. Wilson, six letters. Reagan, six letters. There it is. 
do you want me to play around with your name? And so, you know, it's interesting. I've done my homework where when President Reagan and his wife uh, moved there in Southern California, wouldn't you know it? The street number of their house was, guess what? 666. Well, Mrs. Reagan had it changed. And uh, the, the number, that's the real, real story, had it changed. Hmm. Well, he did receive a deadly wound, but then he, he was healed and he, he's not the Antichrist, so give it up. Mikhail Gorbachev had that very peculiar mark on his forehead. This is not the way you study Bible prophecy. You don't guess. You don't guess. You don't have hunches. You go by irrefutable, overwhelming evidence. Say evidence. Proof positive. This is not based on emotional swings. It's not based on who are your friends. What are your friends telling you? It's based on what do you see in your Bible? And if something is already there, what are you seeing in history? Very important. So President Barack Obama, many said that he was the Antichrist. And uh, Stalin and Saddam Hussein, Chairman Mayo, Kaiser Wilhelm, and the list goes, just goes on and on. Henry Kissinger, I mean, come on, he's got that peculiar accent. And he's still around. President Trump, oh my, so many people would want to believe that President Trump is the Antichrist. And we could go on and on and on. But we are not interested in blind guesswork, idle speculation, tabloid sensationalism, novel fiction books, including religious fiction books called Left Behind. And I'm here to tell you that the Left Behind series left truth behind. We're not interested in wild spun theories. You are about to see how the Bible pulls the mask off of the Antichrist very quickly. Very quickly. And we're going to discover tonight, we're going to discover 10 clues that identify prophecies most wanted. Who is the Antichrist? The Bible will tell us categorically, unequivocally. We will focus upon Daniel's vision of the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7. All right? So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. In this panorama prophetic vision, we see some intriguing symbols. We need to carefully, prayerfully do what? Decode the symbolic language. You know, can I just say this, especially to our young people? Young people are usually the ones more so than those that are older, that will use the terminology, I'm bored. I bet you you don't hear very many older people say that as much. I'm bored. Because by then, as you get older, you realize, you know, I, I don't have time to get bored. There's too much work to be done. Somebody's got to take out the trash. <laughs> and besides, if you're following the Lord, and all of a sudden you feel, Lord, I'm bored. Don't worry, he'll get you to busy. He'll get you working right away. This is something that young people can sink their teeth into and just really feel like they're getting something that's exciting. I think Bible prophecy is exciting to study because you're actually able to see how the Bible explains itself and how the Bible provides the prophetic keys to unlock the symbolism. And you're able to know this and then you're able to share it with others. Why do you think that God in the first place put all sorts of symbolism in Daniel Revelation? Because he's trying to pique our interest. He's trying to get us asking questions like, what does that beast represent? Oh, that's exactly what God wanted you to ask. He wants us to pause and realize that, I guess he really wants us to study, not just read, study the Bible. And so, the Antichrist exposed, the Antichrist exposed, the shocking truth. Let us examine the overwhelming evidence that exposes the Antichrist. And now we're going to go right to the Bible to do this. So don't be surprised if you find this discovery very shocking and troubling, just like Daniel did. In Daniel chapter 7, it said that he was very disturbed by this vision. So don't be surprised if it bothers you some. So we see here 
in the Daniel 2 image, we've got the Daniel 2 image there, we've got the Daniel 2 image right behind me, and we got it on the screen. Remember the head of gold, Babylon, chest and arms of silver, meat of Persia, brass, thighs, Greece, long legs of iron, Rome. Rome was divided, not conquered by a fifth ruling empire, but divided originally into 10 kingdoms that find their modern counterparts in the nations of Europe today. And of course, now Europe is even divided even more, but that's what is represented here. In Daniel chapter seven, instead of metals, you have animals but not animals you're gonna see, okay, in, in our local zoo. You don't have a local zoo here, but you're not gonna see any of these in anywhere. Where's the nearest zoo? All right, anyway, but uh, winged lion. When's the last time you went to a zoo and saw a winged lion? Uh, a bear with three ribs in the mouth of it, and I suppose that's more realistic, but then how about four-headed leper with a couple of sets of wings? And then the fourth one, doesn't even give it a name of what it is, but it says it's ferocious, bloodthirsty, and it has great iron teeth, and it has ten horns. Eerie. Ten horns. Ten horns. Notice. Winged lion, that's Babylon. Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia. The bear is lifted up on one side, representing the fact that you have Medes and Persians, and one would take the ascendancy. And then you have the four-headed leopard, because Alexander the Great when he came in swiftly, like a flying leopard. And um, then, origin, then after he died, his four generals, uh, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucus, all right, I usually get one off. But anyway, these four generals, these four generals fought and the kingdom was divided into fourths. And so then this dragon-like creature would represent pagan Rome and the 10 horns would correspond with the 10 toes. So in Daniel 2, 10 toes, 10 kingdoms. Daniel 7, remember this is all Daniel 7 here. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, going through some of the same history, but then this gives us additional uh, information because the 10 horns represent the 10 kingdoms. But now for, as Paul Harvey would say, now for the, what of the story? Rest stories. So Daniel 7 is an instant replay of Daniel 2. So God's purpose for using rich symbolism in the books of Daniel Revelation is to, number one, catch our attention. Number two, inspire our interest. And number three, lead us to a knowledge and obedience of Jesus Christ. So here we have four strange beasts, I repeat, arising from the tumultuous waters. This is what we see in Daniel chapter 7. So in this panorama prophetic vision, we see some intriguing symbols. We need to carefully, prayerfully decode each one of these uh, to understand this prophecy. All right. So what does a beast symbolize in Bible prophecy? No guesswork. We're going right to the Bible. Daniel 7, 25, uh, 23. Read with me. The fourth beast shall be a fourth what? Kingdom on earth. Bible tells us what a beast represent in the context of symbolic Bible prophecy. So here we have the dramatic rise and fall of four kingdoms, four successive world empires, and then the 10 divisions of the fourth empire, Rome. It's all right there. So then as we continue, by the way, did I tell you to actually go to Daniel 7 and put it in park? Because that's, that's where we're going to be spending the bulk of our time is in Daniel chapter 7. All of these 10 clues are right there in Daniel chapter 7. They're all right there. So we can do this. So in Daniel chapter 7, we see the winged lion, the bear, the four-headed uh, winged leopard, and then this 10-horned ferocious creature. And then all of a sudden, a strange development, a strange phenomenon, a strange appearance as Daniel saw this vision, all of a sudden he sees a little horn pushing up there in the fourth beast. Remember, it has ten horns. Then here comes another little one. Daniel calls it a little horn. And as it was pushing up, three were uprooted. So there were three that were uprooted. And so here comes this little horn power. But don't let it, the, the fact that it's called little horn fool you maybe little, but even its rise, it was powerful, uprooting three of the uh, original uh, kingdoms 
of Europe. And so the ten divisions of Rome, these ten original tribes or kingdoms find their modern counterparts in what? In the modern nations of Europe today. Alamanni, Germans, Franks, French, Saxons, English, Visigoths, Spanish, Burgundian, Swiss, Lombards, Italians, Swavi, Portuguese, Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths, something in common. They're all destroyed. Who is behind it? The Antichrist. Well, who's the Antichrist? Well, that's what we're coming to. Look at, this is, this is Daniel 7, verse 8. After verse 1 to 7, it's all about those animal figures. You have it in your Bible. It'd be in your handout. Daniel 7, verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn. Of what kind of one, everybody? A little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So we can do this. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. And a mouth, so you got the eyes, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Talk about bizarre or surreal. <laughs> Can you imagine having this vision? And you're seeing this bloodthirsty creature, iron teeth, ten horns, and all of a sudden here comes this bizarre, talking, seeing little horn. And so what do you think got his attention? This little horn. And so, who is the little horn power? This is the solved case of the bizarre little talking horn. In Daniel 7, there is a catalog of 10 vital clues that will help us to track down prophecies most wanted. So, 10 prophetic clues. And let's see where all of these characteristics lead to. Number one. It arose out of the fourth beast, right there in Daniel 7, 7 and 8. All right. Clue number two. See, we're the FBI. You know what FBI stands for? FBI investigates, right? So what does FBI stand for? Faithful believers who investigate what they believe, right? All right. Among the ten horns, ten divisions of Rome. So clue number three after the ten horns. So we have location or the birthplace of the Antichrist. Then we have here the timing when it would rise to prominence and power after the ten horns. Well, according to historians, the break of the Roman Empire happened around this time when Rome was broken up at 476 AD is a year, pivotal watershed year, milepost that historians customarily use to depict the fall of the Roman Empire. Romulus Augustulus was deposed from the throne there in Rome. And so Rome collapsed and was, over, was uh, invaded by these barbarian tribes and so forth. So, so Rome fell around uh, eight, uh, 476 AD. And so clue number four, different from the other horns. The others were political in scope and nature. This one would be not only political, it would be religious because it has something to do with worship. All right. So clue number five, a look more stout, that is more pompous, more powerful, more persuasive, more influential, more authoritative than his fellows. That is, it would dominate Europe. All right. Let's keep going. Clue number six, it would uproot three kingdoms. Historically, no guesswork not needed. Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths were uprooted by this power. Number seven. So we've, we've gone here to six. Here's seven. Spoke great words against the Most High. The book of Revelation calls that blasphemy when it's talking about the Antichrist beast. And so this is all. Notice I give you verse references. Number eight, wore out the saints of the Most High. It's a persecuting religious power. Those who wouldn't go along with it would be identified would be labeled and would be persecuted. And so that's Daniel 7, 25. Clue number nine, thought to change times and laws. What are the laws of the Most High? The Ten Commandments. So it would modify or revise them or uh, do whatever it wanted with them. Clue number 10, it rained for a time. Times, a dividing of time. So the Bible makes it very clear a time 
is one year, composed of 360 days, biblically speaking. Times, that's plural, so that would be twice as one, or two years. So you got one year, two years, that's three, and then dividing a time would be, guess what? A half a year. So add that up, 1260 days. But in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals a literal year. And we've already seen this last time we were together. So that's uh, Daniel 7.25, talking about 1260 years. So, the little horn power is not just one person. The Holy Spirit wants you to understand this. The Bible says that this sinister antichrist would have a long history. Thus, you've eliminated a lot of those ones you thought might be the Antichrist. Friends, there's no guesswork needed. What religious power has been around a long time and has been behind persecution, religious persecution? Now, here again, this is very, very important. I'm here to tell you that prophecy is for everybody. Prophecy is for everybody. And God wants us to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. How many still want to know the truth? This is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 and onward. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, the coming of Jesus, will not come unless something happened first. The man, the Bible says the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Friends, that's the Antichrist. So the Bible makes it very clear. The term falling away comes from the Greek word apostasy. Uh, pardon me, apostasia, which means apostasy. So first there would be a, a great, a great falling away. A, a, a very full-blown apostasy. And here would come emerging this apostate religious system, man of sin, antichrist, antichrist beast, little horn. It would arise before we go to be with the Lord. And yet many in the Left Behind series are trying to tell you, whether it's Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsey, whoever they're trying to tell you, John Hagee, I'm just going to put some names out there because you got to know what you believe. And I don't care how popular the person is and you might like them. You know, we're not talking whether you like a person or not. We're talking about what are they teaching? That person can be teaching a lot of truth, but if there's some error there, you should know it. These preachers and teachers, as a matter of fact, the vast majority of Christian literature dealing with Bible prophecy, go to your Christian bookstores, I've been there, and you know what? Common thread, common denominator among books on Bible prophecy in the Christian bookstores today. And uh, the televangelists, they are teaching that the Antichrist is still in the future. That the Antichrist is not the Roman papal power. No wonder there's a whole lot of guessing. If we would just understand that the Antichrist has a reign of terror and supremacy for 1260 years. Now apostasy continues, friends, but a remnant stay with the truth. You shall know the truth. The name of our of our ministry, our nonprofit is called Forever Free Ministries. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Forever free. Amen. John 8 32. Verse 3 Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition, a modern Judas who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Is he God? No. But is he acting and claiming prerogatives and privileges that belong solely to God? Yes. This is the Antichrist. And so God wants you to know the identity of the Antichrist. Are you convinced of that? Yes or no? And so the little horn, the man of sin, the Antichrist, 
the beast, all the same institution or power. So, are you ready to go deeper? Are you ready to go deeper? All right, let's go. Going deeper with God's help. Let's see who fits all of these biblical clues or these biblical characteristics or biblical marks. All right. Clue number one, it arose out of the fourth beast. And clue number two, rises among the ten horns, ten divisions of Rome. There came up among them another little horn. Hmm. Where would the little horn arise then? I need you to yell out yes or no when I go to them, okay? Where would the little horn arise? In Canada, yes or no? No. India, Africa, South America, United States. <laughs> we have a divided church. The answer is on the board, it's Europe. You don't need to guess. I know, but I kind of feel it could be the United States. We're not going on how you feel. We're going by what does the word of God say? And the word of God says it would arise in Europe. And so clue number three. Rises to power after the Ten Horns, after the breakup of the Roman Empire, 476 A.D. So we keep going. Clue number four, different from the other horns, religious and political. We're talking about all roads lead to papal Rome. Look at this history quote. The transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople. The Roman emperor, the, the, the transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome. And at the time, one might have predicted a speedy decline, but the development of the church and the growing authority of the Bishop of Rome or the Pope gave her a new lease on life and made her again the capital. This time, the, what kind of capital? Religious capital of the civilized world taken from Abbott's Roman history, 236. All right. Therefore, Therefore, down went papal, uh, pagan Rome, up came papal Rome. I'll say it again. Down went pagan Rome, up came papal Rome. Even King James himself believed that following the removal of the Roman emperors, the reign of Antichrist began. This was, of course, a reference to the rise of the papacy, which he believed to be the Antichrist and mystery of iniquity. So whenever you think of King James, even he believed this. Clue number five. A look more stout than his fellows that dominated Europe, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Notice that's in Daniel 7, verse 20. And so, did the papacy dominate Europe during the Middle Ages and during the Dark Ages? Yes, it did. So, the popes during this time seem to have absolute control and sway of the kings. As a matter of fact, the king seemed to be under the bewitching spell of the papacy. Yes, Mr. Pope. Yes. The kings feared the threat of being excommunicated by the brazen popes. So they wielded a whole lot of religious political power. In reality, the kings were mere puppets of the popes. That's history. And just making it simple, simple, simple. Simplify it. You don't have to read a lot of scholarly articles and th books that are 2,000 pages and so forth. Yes, study. Yes, learn. But I'm just going to give you just real simple highlights here. Down went pagan Rome. Up came papal Rome. The papal Rome is the Antichrist. Myers General History, page 4, 454, 455. Look at this painting. Hmm. Pope crowning a king. Interesting. Oh, let me read it there. Almost all the kings and princes of Europe swore fealty that is loyalty to him as their overlord. You've heard the expression landlord. If you live in an apartment and there's a landlord, you're not the landlord. You're the right. So they swore. Notice all the princes of your swore loyalty to the popes as their overlord. Clue number six uproots three kingdoms, Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. Before whom three fell, according to Daniel 7, verse 8, 20, and 24. So did the papacy orchestrate the demise of these three opposing kingdoms? See, out of the ten, three of them were opposing the rise of the papacy. So when were these three horns uprooted? Remember, we have a time prophecy. We need to know when that time prophecy began. So Heruli destroyed 493. A.D. 493. Vandals destroyed A.D. 534. Ostrogoths destroyed by A.D. 
538. This is a pivotal year. A.D. 538. All of these three opposing kingdoms were uprooted by this, this very important year. 538 A.D. Clue number seven. This is Daniel 7.25. Spoke great words against the Most High. The Most High. That's blasphemy. He shall speak great words against the Most High. And so, behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So it's based on man's wisdom when you say, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, it's a figurative way of saying I understand. Or I, and so this, this is based on just man's wisdom, which is very limited, right? An interpretation of Scripture. And so the, the Bible makes it very clear that this is blasphemy. What is the... Bible's definition of blasphemy. The Bible defines blasphemy as assuming any rights or power and titles that belong to God alone. All right? Remember Jesus was falsely accused of committing blasphemy or speaking blasphemy when he claimed to forgive sin or when he claimed to be equal with God or God in the flesh? Now, of course, Jesus was falsely accused because Jesus is all who he claimed to be. But notice... Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus said, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He forgave this man on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and what? Go to your house. So Jesus was making it very clear that he has the authority, the prerogative, the right to forgive sin. Aren't you glad for that? And so the Jews answered him saying, for good work, we stone, do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. John 10, verse 33. But Jesus, read John 1. Jesus, the Bible says, is one with the Father. He is God in the flesh. Amen? And so does the papacy claim the titles and prerogatives which belong solely exclusively to God? Absolutely. Does the papacy make the presumptuous claim to forgive sin and prerogatives that belong only to God? Here are a few of those blasphemous beliefs and practices. Confession to a man. Confession to an earthly priest. That's blasphemy. This is taken from the Catholic priest, pages 78, 79. Seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Catholic priest. Confess to a priest. Friends, that's taking your eyes off Jesus. The whole goal of our life is to get our eyes on Jesus who alone can save us. And so, what about Pope Francis? What did the Pope really say about confession during COVID-19? What did he really say? Well, he said that, that we need to confess our sins to a priest. And so, yes, this is what Pope Francis believes as well. Here he is. Do not be afraid of confession, Pope Francis. Now, you might like Pope Francis. I mean, he does a lot of compassionate, impressive things like um, washing the feet of the homeless or doing different things like that. So the Pope has done and is doing a lot of good things. So did Judas Iscariot. You see, we can't go by, is a person likable or not? We must go by, what are they teaching? What are they telling us to follow? What are they telling us to believe? And we got to be careful about that. So Catholic Vote website, do not be afraid of confession. One who is in line to confess, this Pope saying this, himself feels all these things even shame but then when he finishes confessing he leaves free great beautiful forgiven happy and this is the beauty of confession doesn't it sound christian but when you know what the bible says you realize this is blasphemy one this is the catechism page 374 one who desires to obtain reconciliation with god and with the church must confess to a priest all the unconfessed grave sins he remembers after carefully examining his or examined his conscience. According to the church's command, after 
Having attained the age of discretion, each of the faithful is bound by an obligation faithfully to confess serious sins at least once a year. Page 365. Dignity and duties of the priest, Alphonsus Liguri says, to pardon a single sin requires all the omnipotence of God. But what only God can do by his omnipotence, the priest can also do. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, Paul said, for there is one God and what? One mediator, that is one priest, one advocate, one intercessor between God and man. Who is it, everybody? The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Are you glad that Jesus paid your debt in full? All the sins you've been, that, that you have committed, if you give them to Jesus, you're forgiven. When you really believe that your sins are forgiven, you know you're right with God. You're not, well, I hope I'm right with God. You ought to know that you're right with God. How many agree? We can't go around in life thinking, I kind of hope I'm all right with God. What kind of faith is that? That's not a faith that'll save you. You must know in whom you have believed in. You must know that Jesus is your savior. Do you believe the Bible? Then don't speak about, well, I don't know if I'm right with God. Don't talk like that. Say, Jesus, you are my savior. I believe in you. I believe your promises. I will not mock you by not believing your promises. I will trust you, Lord. I have salvation in Jesus. Amen. So you must let us talk faith. Talk faith. Not let one doubt come out of your mouth. Talk faith. Let the devil know you believe in Jesus, not in his lies. And then you'll feel like witnessing because you actually believe in the gospel. You actually believe in the gospel. The Bible says, can we read this together? Thunder it out with me. Here we go. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let me ask you this. Privately speaking, keep it to yourself. Think of the worst mistake you've made in your life. The biggest sin you've ever committed. And I can guarantee you this. Satan will keep bringing it up over and over and over and over again. Why? Because he wants you to feel like you've gone too far. He wants you to feel like you've committed the unpardonable sin. He wants you to feel like you're hopeless. He wants you to feel like, no, everything's forgiven, but not that thing. I'm here to tell you. This scripture is for you, my friends. It's for me that all that we've messed up in the past. Now, if you have a beautiful past, I say hallelujah. But I bet you no matter how perfect you may think you are, you've made some big mistakes. And God is a God of forgiveness. Hallelujah. First John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Is this good news? All that we might teach our children, we might teach the young people, you can know you're right with God. He is a loving father. He loved us so much that he gave his son to die for the likes of us. And so Jesus' blood alone is sufficient to save you. Believe it. I pray that from this day forward, you will talk faith more like you than you have ever done in the past. That you actually let people know you believe that Jesus Christ is your savior, your Lord, your hope, your mediator, your high priest. He's everything. Amen. And so the word antichrist, the word anti can have several meanings. It can mean against Christ, but it can also mean in place of Christ. And by them setting up this false priestly system and saying you need to go and confess your sins to these priests that is antichrist that is putting yourself in place of christ thou art a priest forever says the ordaining bishop he is not longer a man a sinful child of adam but an altar christos what does that mean I'll tell you what it means another christ another christ forever a priest of the most high with power over the almighty I don't even like reading these, but you need to know what's being taught. Another Christ? We don't need another Christ. But you see, here's how this system operates. Oh, you want assurance of salvation? Yes, believe in Jesus. 
but also confess to the priest and pray to Mary and this and that and do the rosary and do all of these different things and then somewhere along the way, maybe you can have assurance. No wonder many people don't have any assurance. Never feeling like they measure up. Friends, the blood of Jesus Christ is our only hope. And it's a bright hope. It's a bright hope. Amen. Amen. For our ecclesiastical dictionary, the Pope is of so great dignity, so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God, and the vicar of God for our ecclesiastical dictionary. Pope Leo XIII said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. I don't even like reading it, but this, these are the beliefs. These are the beliefs. But are you going to see this in mainline, uh, you know, primetime news? No. No, you're not going to see this in the news. Are you going to hear this whenever the popes come to visit here? Are you going to hear this on the news? No. Second Thessalonians 2, 2 and 3. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Many think like, well, that's the third temple. Friends, this is speaking about a power that's been around 1260 years. And we're dealing here with a power sits in the temple. What's the temple? Well, who's writing in the first place? Who is this writing? This is Paul. Did Paul talk about the body as the temple? And who did he say is the body? The body of believers, church members, the church. So the Bible makes it very clear that the Antichrist would arise amidst the Christian believers. Just like Judas Iscariot was there, he was in the inner circle of the twelve. So this system would arise in the Christian temple, in the Christian church, and would deceive many. And so, number two, plenary indulgences. Pope Francis authorizes plenary indulgences and general absolution as coronavirus crisis escalates. I mean, I have so much material and so much slides and research and so forth. I can only share so much in three weeks, but I'll do the best I can. But, um, but, and by the way, I urge you to watch my channel. As long as you keep coming night by night, don't dare go to my channel and not show up. All those in favor say aye. All right, now come on now. All right. Yeah, just keep coming. Just keep coming. But if you can do some binge watching on my YouTube channel called Amazing Prophecies, you will see I cover a lot of these topics. So this is the Catholic Catechism. And by the way, I want to say this very, as just as gently and as clear as I possibly can. There will be many Catholics in heaven. There will be many Catholics not in heaven. There will be many Protestants in heaven. There will be many Protestants not in heaven. I'm not the judge, but we know this. There will be many that will say on judgment day, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Did Judas Iscariot do things in the name of Jesus? He was lost. So we must be careful. We must be careful. Let's keep going. So, so, oh, well, so this is very significant. Through indulgences, the faithful can obtain the remission of temporal punishment resulting from sin for themselves and also for the souls in purgatory. Does the Bible teach purgatory? Does it teach limbo? No, those are not in the Bible. Now, there are extra books in the Catholic version of the Bible, Douay version. But these books those books that are in there in addition to the 66 books are not inspired by the Holy Spirit and hence do not belong to what is known as the canon of Scripture. And you can do research online. just have to be careful. Number three, penance. Catholic Catechism, this, this sacrament of penance is necessary for salvation for those who have fallen after baptism, just as baptism is necessary for salvation for those who have not yet been reborn. Does the Bible teach penance? Does it teach indulgences? It's not there. Purgatory, we've already established, that's not in the, in the Bible. Purgatory is not in the Bible, and yet millions and millions and millions uh, are, uh, believe this. 
The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. It's not in the Bible. Number five, infallibility of the Pope's teachings. And number six, sprinkling for baptism. What does the Bible teach about baptism? By the way, at the end of this three weeks, we're going to have a big baptism. For those who want to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they want to be baptized like Jesus was, by immersion, the very term baptism means baptizo, which means to dip or to submerge in the water. How many of you are going to be baptized? You should be just like Jesus was baptized. Amen. What does the Bible teach about baptism? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism. So people that are baptized here, they don't get in the baptistry and then Pastor Angel just pours a little water over their head, right? That's not the way it is. They are what? Buried with them through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk at newness of life. So what does the Roman papal power teach and practice about baptism? They teach sprinkling. They teach pouring and, and, and baptism of, uh, of babies. But the Bible doesn't teach that at all. Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. There are different popular traditions that are not supported by Scripture. Mark 7, verse 9. Number 7, literalizing of emblems of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the communion, Lord's Supper, sy symbolic elements become the actual body and blood of Christ is what they believe in the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and, uh, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. What are they saying? that this is actually transformed into the blood and flesh of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is kind of like, you know, keeps being crucified in a sense. And friends, as Protestants, we do not believe that. We believe it's symbolic. Amen? And so praying to Mother Mary and the saints, is that in the Bible? It is not in the Bible. And yet, Pope Francis is continually seen, as previous popes are seen, bowing at shrines of Mary. And so, gathered together, Vatican News, gathered together in prayer with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so, don't have time to get into all of that. But Catechism says, taken up to heaven, she, Mary, did not lay aside the saving office, but by her manifold intercession, continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. I want to say this very quick, clearly. All you need is Jesus. That's the whole thrust of my message tonight. My message tonight is look away from yourself. Look away from others. Look to Jesus Christ and you'll be okay. You'll be saved. You are safe looking at Jesus. When you look to yourself, either because you think you're all that or because you feel hopeless, you will not find salvation in yourself. But there are many people that feel because they're doing different things, and it might even be the right things, that somehow they'll be okay. The only way we know we're going to be okay is if we're trusting in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we believe that He will save us because He said He would. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of Advocate, Helper, Benefactrix, uh, Benefactress, and Mediatrix. But we just read, Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 5, that we only need one mediator. There's no room for Mary. John Paul II devoted his pontificate to Mother Mary so that in his coat of arms, there's an M. Uh, there, this stands for Mary. Pope consecrates world to immaculate heart of Mary in the news of the Pope there bowing before shrines of Mary. And Pope Francis consecrating the world to Mary culminates Fatima celebration Approximately 150,000 pilgrims jam St. Peter's Square for the occasion. And so Pope Francis leads Philadelphia in prayer to Mary and Joseph to protect families. Before the final blessing, let's pray a prayer to Mary and also an invocation to St. Joseph so that they can protect our families and they can help us to believe that it's worth the struggle and the fight for the good of the family.
Hail Mary, full of grace, and our Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus, he prayed. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Number nine, images to help worship. We don't need images. And yet, we read in the Catechism, through sacred images, the Holy Mother of God, of the angels and of the saints, we venerate the persons represented. And that's where you see all sorts of statutes there and so forth. And yet the Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You say, oh, but those are just used as a vehicle of worship. Then why are people bowing down to them? And why, why this is a violation of the second commandment. Number 10, change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. That's right. That's right. Notice this. This was a clue that we had. Clue number eight. Think to change times and laws. What do you call the laws of the Most High? The Ten Commandments. And what would this power think to do? I'm highlighting it. Change. Change change what? Something about the laws of God. They would change it. What's the only commandment out of the Ten Commandments that has anything to do with time? Put it together. Three things. Laws, that's the law of, of the Most High, the Ten Commandments. Times, that's about the seventh day Sabbath. And they would do what? Change the Sabbath. Did it happen? The Bible said it would. And that certainly has. In Austin, Texas, they have a monument of the Ten Commandments. And if you study it and so forth, you will discover, you will discover that there are commandments there, but we must learn that the second commandment in the Catholic version, the second commandment in the catechism has been deleted. You say, but Mark, no, 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 I read, I read 10 there in the catechism. No, it's actually nine. Well, how did they make up for it? Then they went to the 10th commandment and they split that and made it two commandments so that 10 minus one equals 10 because you split the 10th one. Now you know the rest of the story. You mean to tell me that this religious system claims that God gave them the authority to change God's 10 commandments? That is correct. Don't take my word for it. I've done my homework. You'll see things in your handouts and so forth. Friends, we're just scratching the surface. You know what? I'll make you this promise. You keep tracking with us. You will have a better understanding of what's really going on behind the news than you ever thought you could, could understand. Would you agree? We must not be fooled. We must not be deceived. The wise shall understand. Daniel 12, verse 10. How many want to be among the wise, among the remnant who understand? And so, correct version, correct version is here, and, uh, and yet, you see the one about images? That's there in Austin. But you'll go in front of different churches and see monuments of a Catholic version where the second commandment is gone. And the one about thou shalt not covet is made into two. And then the third change they made is what? To the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. So what is true worship? We don't want all of those images, but yet what do they claim? The Pope can modify law since his power is not of man, but of God. And he acts in the place of God upon earth. So what they believe is that God gave them the authority to do this. That God is fine with this because he gave them the authority to do it. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Exodus about the Ten Commandments. Our clock is ticking, but we're not done. Are we learning something? All right. Praise the Lord, everybody. You could be doing a whole lot of other things, but I commend you for coming. God will bless you. Look here at Romans, uh, pardon me, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, uh, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day, the seventh day, the what day? The seventh day, that's Saturday. The seventh day is the Sabbath 
of the Lord your God. Well, if it's the Sabbath of the Lord, then it's the Lord's day because the Sabbath belongs to the Lord. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall do no work. Now, what part of that don't we understand? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall do no work. Now, watch this. This is God writing this with his own finger. And the new covenant is he writes it in our heart. Hebrews 8, verse 10, New Testament. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall do no work. Now, watch this. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. I think God is saying, do not work on the Sabbath. Why? Verse 11. For in six days, the Lord made. What's another word for made? Created. For in six days, the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, I keep every day holy. No, you don't. Because God alone can make a day holy. No church can do it. No saint can do it. Only God can make a day holy. And he did not make seven days holy. He said six days you shall labor. But the seventh day is a holy day. Now, I can go to church seven days. As a matter of fact, we're here five nights out of the week, including Sunday night. You know, we can, we can go to church seven days a week if we want to. But there's only one day that is the Sabbath day that is holy day. And God says, don't work on that day. That ought to be our primary day of going to church. Amen. Don't get me wrong. I say you go to church seven days a week if you want. But my point is this, is that this is God speaking. This is God speaking. Remember the, not of, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. How many agree this is for us, not against us? This is a positive, not a negative. This is very practical, but it's also prophetic. Prophetic in the sense that God said, this power is going to change the Sabbath. So the Bible predicted it. History reveals it. What are we going to do with it? I say, let's go with the word of God. Let's go with the word of God. In Genesis 2, let's go there very quickly. Genesis 2, just back up a book. And we're going here to Genesis chapter 2. And we're looking there at Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Sanctified it means set it apart. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. You say, Mark, I thought the Sabbath is just for the Jews. God gave the Sabbath a long time before there was a Jew. The Sabbath is for everyone. Just like the Ten Commandments. Are the Ten Commandments just for the Jews or are they for everyone? Yeah, hey, I can steal, you know. But the commandment, no, 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 those are just for the Jews. I can steal. I'm a Christian. As Christians, we want to uplift all of these Ten Commandments. It's all about loving obedience to God. What did Jesus say? Let's read this together, everybody. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So if Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath, who does the Sabbath belong to? Does it belong to a denomination? No, but don't you want to be among a remnant who are going to uplift all of these different things? Don't look at majority. You're off, you're off base there. Look at a remnant. Look, the wise, only the wise shall understand. And so, did Jesus change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? He said, well, Mark, Jesus rose on Sunday, and so now we keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. Show me a scripture that tells us to do that. Well, didn't Paul say this? That's why you keep studying the handouts. Watch my channel. Things will become clear. When everything doesn't come clear just in one night. That's why we're here together three weeks. Just like, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't expect to every, understand everything in just one hour. But we've learned a lot already tonight. And our time is waning. Not done quite yet. Matthew 5, 17. Do not 
think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus never asked us to keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. There's not, it's not in the Bible. The day of the resurrection is a day after the Sabbath. Go with me to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Are we learning things tonight? Matthew chapter 28. Yes, it was the Roman Catholic Church that changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week, what's that? Sunday, began to dawn. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and Jesus had been resurrected. So what day does the Bible call the day of the resurrection? It just calls it the first day. But what does it call, what does the Bible call the day before the resurrection? What does it call it? Jesus rested in the tomb on the seventh day Sabbath, and he did it on purpose. Even in his death, he associated rest with the Sabbath. Amen? Absolutely beautiful. And so Jesus said, don't even think that I came to, dis to, to destroy or to change these Ten Commandments. So how did Jesus observe the Sabbath? Well, he worked. But what kind of work was it? Spiritual work. When he was a carpenter, did he do his carpentry on the Sabbath? No. He had a custom of going to church on Saturday. Notice. So he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom or habit was, his tradition, he went into the synagogue, the church, on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. What did Jesus do all through his life? He went to church on the seventh day Sabbath. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for Mark Fox. It's good enough for me. Amen? All you need is the word of God. All you need is the word of God. So how special was the Sabbath to Jesus? Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so, but Mark, what about Sunday? Mark, are you telling me that everybody is wrong practically in the Christian community? Listen to me. When's the last time you heard a sermon on the Antichrist like you've heard it here tonight? Most are not teaching this. Oh, the Antichrist is future. Oh, it is Nero in the past. Well, we don't know. Friends, you've learned who the Antichrist is now. And it's the Antichrist that changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And the whole world follows. Are you saying that those who keep Sunday and don't keep Saturday are going to be lost? Of course I'm not saying that. Because we're only held accountable for the light that God gives to us. But when we know what the Bible teaches, prophecy is for obedience. And only the wise will understand because only the wise are willing to be purified. Daniel 12, verse 10. God wanted me to go to that scripture. That's why we we're trying to figure a little bit about the PowerPoint so that in the intervening time, God flashed these scriptures in my mind to go turn to them. God wants you to be in Daniel 12, verse 10, among the wise. And so... For laying aside the commandment of God, the Sabbath, he hold to the tradition of men, Sunday. And so, how could so many false teachings be adopted by millions of Christians during the Dark Ages? How could this happen? Clue number nine, wore out the saints of the Most High. It's a persecuting power. During the centuries of the Dark Ages, the average person did not have a Bible. How many have at least one Bible that's yours? How many have two? Three? Four? Five? Six? Seven? Seven's a perfect number. I'm going to stop right there. How many of you, by your phone, have countless Bibles? You can go to different translations and so forth. And you might have a lot of Bibles, you know, at home, different versions or whatever. I recommend the King James and New King James, a lot of other versions. Yeah, you can read them and look at them. But I, I, I believe King James is probably the best and New King James after that. So during the centuries of the Dark Ages, the average person did not have a Bible. Matter of fact, to have a Bible was punishable by death. A famine of hearing the words of the Lord during the Dark Ages, Amos 8 and verse 11. 
truth was thrown to the ground by the Roman papal power during the Dark Ages, uh, Daniel 8 and verse 12. Why was this period called Dark Ages? My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge, Hosea 4 and verse number 6. 50 million people lost their lives during the Dark Ages. That is heartrending. These are precious people, precious just like you. Unbelievable. Unfair trials. There was no fairness. Labeled as heretics, condemned to death, tortured, burned at the stake. John Huss in Bohemia in 1415 was indicted by the church and he said today i will gladly die john's uh, july 6 14 15 and let me just say this when the flames were enveloping him he was heard singing praises to god clue number 10 final point reign for a time times and the dividing of time time times the dividing of time Time, one year, 360 days. Times, two years of 720 days. Half a time, half a year of 180 days. Add it up, 1260 days. But in Bible prophecy, one day, I have appointed each day for a year. Ezekiel 4, 6. One day equals one year. So this is talking about what? This is talking about 1260 what? Years. A long, long time period. So we know all roads lead to papal Rome. So when does this time period uh, begin? When does this begin? It begins when Emperor Justinian made the Bishop of Rome. It must begin with an event or a series of events which gave incredible power to this system, which Emperor Justinian did. What did he do? Listen to this. Vigilius ascended the papal chair, 538 AD, under the military protection of Belisarius. Have we seen that date before? Remember, three horns had to be uprooted by 538 AD. And so look at 538 AD, there was a Roman legal decree that was issued that made the Bishop of Rome head of all churches, definer of doctrine, and corrector of heretics. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what happened? A bloodbath. What happened? The Dark Ages. So three horns were uprooted by this year, 538 A.D. And so, 1260 years began. 538 A.D. when they got political power by a decree, a legal decree. So legally, they got political power. Five, they already existed as a religious power, but now they would have political authority given to them to correct heretics even. And this ushered in the Dark Ages. 1260 years runs out in 1798. What happened then? It would lose political power for a while. In 1798, he, Berthier, at the orders of Napoleon, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. Where is this found? Encyclopedia Americana, 1941 edition. And so Pope Pius VI was to, uh, uh, Napoleon's general, Berthier, captured Pope Pius VI, pulled off his pontifical ring, bound him, and took him into exile in Valence, France, where he died the next year, 1798. And everybody thought the last pope has reigned. But the Bible said it would have a comeback. The deadly wound would be healed, to borrow imagery of Revelation 13. So here's Pope Pius VI on his deathbed. As others are gathered around, he died in exile. So how can we know for sure that the Antichrist is not future, but is present? How can we know for sure, for sure? The papacy has roots in the distant past. It had a reign of terror for 12 and a six years. So do not let anyone tell you that the Antichrist is the future. Is this a new theory? It is not. Did I hatch something brand new? New interpretation. No, friends. No. Martin Luther was the first to identify that papacy as such with the Antichrist, a view that was to become dogma for all Protestant churches, Newsing Magazine. And the, Martin Luther said, I feel much freer now that I am certain the Pope is the Antichrist. No wonder what they wanted to get rid of him. And he said, when he was tried, 
He went through a religious tribunal. He was a religious trial. And they told him to recant or face the consequences. And he said, here I stand. I can do no other, none other. May God help me. I wonder tonight, do you love truth as I close? I got to close now, but I want to make an appeal. Are you willing to stand on the Bible? Are you willing to say, Jesus, I don't understand a lot, but I do understand one thing. I must stand on the Word of God. If you would like to do like Martin Luther and you'd like to say, here I stand, I can do none other than stand right now and let Jesus know that this is what you stand with, the Word of God. You stand by the Word of God, stand up. If you're just like Martin Luther, here I stand. Everybody say, here I stand. I can do none other. May God help me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to stand with your word and on your word. Help us to trust you with all of our heart. Lord, we've learned a lot of new things tonight. Help us to leave here thankful for truth. In Jesus' name, amen.